بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Welcome to this presentation entitled The Story of Riba, The Growth Delusion And what we hope to do in this presentation is to articulate the trajectory of usury and interest uh, as it primarily developed in, in, in Western Europe And in the course of this presentation we will also Uh, illustrate its contrast within the Muslim world uh, right until the present day uh, and inshallah hopefully um, allude to the various issues that have come about uh, in terms of usury and interest uh, concerning our money or what we take to be money. So this first presentation is about uh, something we've called intention and direction. And what we intend by this, what we're hoping to say is that Islam places um, paramount importance on the role of intention. Uh, this is evident by the fact that uh, Muslims are tasked to say in their daily prayers uh, to ask for guidance to the straight path. And the Quran itself uh, often asks the question, where then are you headed? So the implication therein is that human beings are on a journey. And the, the, this nature of this journey, on the one hand, is a return to God, as the Quran says, إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ To God you will all be returned. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a choice in how we interact with this world to enable our returning to be one of benefit to us, or to be one of detriment. And so the Quran uh, says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum. La yadurrukum man dalla idha ahtadaytum. Ila Allahi marji'ukum jami'a fayunabbi'ukum bima kuntum ta'amanu. The Quran says, O oh, you, oh, you who have believed, upon you is responsibility for your own selves. Those who have gone astray will not harm anyone ultimately not harm you, either those who are guided in the slightest when you have been guided. And to God is your return altogether. And then he will inform you of what you used to do. And so the imperative in Islam is in our own choices, we have to orientate ourselves towards God. The Quran says, Direct your face, which by which is meant your entirety, towards this pure religion of God. And that's why the Prophet, in what is a hugely important saying, said, Actions are by intentions. And he said, And so every person should only have whatsoever they intend. So someone whose emigration is for, whose journeying is for God and his messenger, then his journeying is truly for God and his messenger. And whomsoever journeys, Or takes on this path of journeys of the literal word is hijra for worldly benefits or for like for example to marry a woman then his emigration will be for whatsoever he emigrated for and so the idea here is that um, that true faith embodies an orientation and so when we start this this journey I was studying about the journey of riba we have to look into Uh, a, firstly, our own intentions in studying this, but secondly, to see how intention itself unfolds in this journey of riba, in this sto story of the unfolding of money. And so what I hope to say by that is that uh, we, in the current world today, our financial system arises out of a certain soil, you know, or we could say a certain dust. And what I mean by that is that the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said that towards the end of time, people would either all be transacting in riba or they would be covered in its hubar, in its dust. And so there is a dust, there is a nature of money today that co-ops all of us to follow a certain logic. And what is that nature of money? It's namely the legalization of interest and its accompanying financial architecture. Today, interest-based money permeates all of our relationships, because money is often the societal conduit. It's the means by which we build our institutions. And many of us 
forget or unaware that our type of money also uh, introduces a relationship dynamic. And so um, you, many of you may have heard the saying that uh, money is the root of all evil or something along those lines. And uh, whilst it's not necessarily money to, per se, but if these, the way money has been designed necessitates a type of um, separation, then it does in many sense function in that way. And so interest has a logic that co-ops society and its institutions. And this is something we're hoping to cover in this presentation. And this is very important because any remedial endeavor, any attempt to change such a system implies that we need to be aware of this, right? And so th that's why we should always bear in mind this, this question that, I, that, I met, uh, that the Quran poses and which I alluded to at the beginning, which is, where then are, you, where there, uh, where then are you headed? And so we come to the first slide. What is money? How did money itself arise? Now, here, um, there is actually a difference of opinion uh, in terms of the origins of money between anthropologists and economists. Most economists tend to take the line um, often uh, attributed and advocated by uh, Adam Smith, the late professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow, when he wrote his landmark book, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776, he claimed that uh, effectively uh, money arose as a movement from barter economies to a market economy. And uh, this kind of movement towards something called the economy, the market economy, was a natural progression from people um, uh, in the nature of barter. Barter is when we, we only have uh, items and goods. And so we'll exchange, um, say, some commodity for something that someone else has. So for example, if we go back to a traditional village, someone may have cows, another person has chickens. And then someone wants to get the chickens now. So he says, I've got cows, I'll give you a cow. And then they agree to barter amongst themselves. So one cow is equal to three chickens or whatever. And then they swap. And so that barter, that trade, allows for them to get their needs. Now, what economists say is that there is inevitability in such a scenario whereby there might not be a synchronicity of needs. That the person who wants to get the chickens um, may want to exchange his cows, but the chicken seller or the chicken, the one who owns the chickens, doesn't need a cow or doesn't want a cow. And so this mismatch of needs necessitates a, an alternative means of exchange. And this is how economists posited that money came into being. Um, now here, uh, anthropologists challenge this narrative, primarily by saying that um, there doesn't exist uh, any historical evidence of a so-called barter economy. Uh, and so uh, what they say is that money is something that is almost, it's been existent pre-recorded history, right? something that's been existent at the dawn of civilization. But in its earliest forms, it took the form of what we know as mutual credit. In other words, um, an, an early people would exist in what called the gift networks or gift economies. Economies whereby the tribe or the family is deeply connected to one another. And just as you and your family Tomorrow, you know, if you end up having to pay something to your wife or, your, or, 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 um, or, or give some money to your children, then, uh, if, you know, if you do, are keeping a tally or, or a track of the money, then it's not because of your lack of trust. It's probably more a case of trying to facilitate funds. But generally speaking, people in a family are happy assuming debt amongst one another. You're not holding your wife or your child accountable to pay you back the money that you've given. And so you are very happy being indebted to one another because indebtedness in the context of the family implies relationship, implies being connected. And this is what anthropologists found uh, as most traditional forms of money to be, uh, that money um, in the tribal network or, or these indigenous kind of people wasn't necessitated because within the tribe it was very uh, to be mutually indebted was a form of inclusion. 
And uh, uh, so someone like David Graeber, who's this very, very great, um, very interesting uh, financial anthropologist, and he's someone I'll be quoting quite a lot in the course of this presentation, specifically uh, using his book, um, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. So this is a book I would recommend those of you who are interested in this topic to go and buy. So David Graeber states that um, the, the, this idea of the barter economy going on to become part of the market economy, this is the great founding myth of the discipline of economics. And it was brought about by the likes of Adam Smith and others, specifically because they wanted to posit the economy as being operative within a kind of a sense of laws, a self-regulating natural system, because they wanted it to fit within the evolving um, nature of science, specifically uh, Newtonian physics, uh, whereby it could be um, turned and separated uh, from, um, from a kind of subjectivity into a set of objective principles that could be explained in, in a very uh, positivistic way, in a very deterministic way. And so David Graeber criticizes this and other anthropologists criticize this because they say there is no evidence. Now, why have I chosen to raise this point here is because here, right at the very inception of the origins of money, we are seeing very different narratives. Anthropologists say that the origins of money is actually trust and um, money outside of the tribe become necessitated because you're now dealing with a stranger. And so you have to inscribe this trust. So you want to refer to a common medium. Usually anthropologists say that what was used was a unit of account, that something could commonly be aware and everyone could accept that this is something that's being tracked. And then later on, there'd be mediums of exchange, certain denominations. Coinage would have come very late but the point is that money is essentially the inscription of trust. And so you're trying to form a relationship with an other. And that relationship is already assumed within the tribal network. Economists don't see money that way. Economists very much define money straight away by its functions. So a standard economic definition of money would be, now to come back to its functions, that it is a medium of exchange. It is a unit of account. It is a store of value. And some add on a fourth uh, function, which is a standard of deferred payment. So um, we'll, we'll cover these in, in a bit more detail, but within this definition itself of the economist as to what money is. So they're not defining what money is now. They're defining what money does, uh, as opposed to the more inclusive and holistic definition of money by anthropologists, they're defining what money does. And even in their definition of what money does, there becomes an initial conflict. Because to say something is in a medium of exchange, and then to simultaneously say it is a store of value, implies an opposite. Because if something is meant to facilitate exchange, then if it's simultaneously something that facilitates storage, then as the Arabs would say, these are opposites that don't meet. And in fact, this was a criticism or a debate within economics in general. So you have different schools of economics and you have what's known as the Austrian School of Economics. Its founder was someone called Karl Menger. Um, and he, uh, referred, when referring to this kind of definition, said that uh, things like a, a unit of account or a store of value, these are not... Uh, what he called essential natures of money. They are accidental. In other words, they are secondary and they arise because um, a store of value or a measure of a value or a unit of account, all of these things are functions that necessarily exist because once you use a means of exchange, then that storage of value is the anticipation of that exchange value in the future. And so what he was trying to say was that primacy has to always be the medium of exchange. In fact, his, his leading student, Ludwig von Mises, um, built on this theory in his book, uh, The Theory of Money and Credit, and said that uh, every other definition of money should be subject, so should be secondary to the principle of money serving its purpose as a medium of exchange. 
And that's why uh, another famous German economist, roughly the same time as him, by the name of Silvio Gessel, stated that if money was to be seen, if money was not to be used primarily as a means of exchange, but becomes something that's hoarded and seen as valuable in itself, then the inevitable outcome of such money would that it would be that it is taken out of circulation by the rich as a way of storing wealth. And he held, Silvio Gessel held, that this was actually a conflict at the heart of money. And so he deliberately proposed a form of money. He called it free money, a money that was, interestingly, he said, should be introduced interest-free. So there is no uh, uh, interest, because as soon as you think we're going to get usury on money or money can get more money, then it encourages hoarding. And he also um, said that once used, it should be taken out of circulation. I mean, he inspired... Um, a lot of other experiments with money. We, I can't, don't want to go into much now, but the concept of demarrage currencies, of currencies that when they're not being circulated, they literally decrease in value. And this is what's often known as negative interest, doing the opposite to what interest does. So we can see even by this slight definitions and these debates within economic schools that um, straight away there is an understanding that um, money to function in the best possible way should not start accruing value in and of itself, but it should be something that facilitates exchange. Now, well before any of these economists came on the scene, uh, this was something that was articulated uh, firstly in the Quran itself. The Quran says, uh, that one of the principles of money is that it not circulate only between the rich amongst you. Which is why one of the great scholars of, of early Islam, Imam Hassan al-Basri, uh, was a renowned scholar of the first century of Islamic history. And he explained the nature of money by saying, money is such a companion of yours that it doesn't benefit unless it actually leaves you. In other words, to encourage this circulation of money. The Quran also elsewhere says, وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ حُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَةٍ says, woe to every person who's given to scorning and mocking others, this kind of arrogance that can arise out of what? It says, someone who accumulates wealth and is constantly counting it. So this idea is, is the Quran is, denig is, 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 is denigrating this attribute of hoarding money. Why and why does this happen? Because the Quran says, Such a person thinks that his wealth will make him eternal. <laughs> Whereas he's not eternal, he will perish. And what stays, the Quran is trying to instill a different consciousness. What stays is how you use your wealth, how you use your wealth for the benefit uh, of others, as well as using it to do good in this world. Elsewhere, the Quran speaks about this negative tendency to amass. And it says, That you are distracted, it says, by, by takathur, this piling up and amassing of, of wealth and property. Until you reach the graves. And for such people, often that is the only point that this thing ends when a person comes to you know, die. And so the Prophet himself, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said that if a human being was to own, many a human being, if they were to own two valleys of gold, then he would strive to only have a third one. And it is only the dust of that grave that may fill the belly of such a human being. And so uh, following on from this line of thought, many pioneering Muslim scholars, and I'm just going to mention one illustrative one because he was such a huge figure, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, uh, known as the proof of Islam because he was such an amazing scholar of Islam. And he wrote in his landmark book, Ahya Ulum al -Din, Revival of the Religious Sciences. He wrote that uh, dirhams and dinars, right? basically uh, money uh, in the form of dirhams and dinars, which is silver and gold coinage, are a blessing of God. And they in themselves have no intrinsic value, but they serve as a measure for means of exchange. And they're not an objective in themselves. So whoever hoards them is disregarding the blessings of God. And it's only someone who trades in money itself who's doing justice to that purpose, right? Um, one of the famous statements he said is, al-naqtu, uh, money, there is no gharad, there is no uh, uh, 
there is no, no um, uh, uh, aim in them, right? In and of themselves, but they are the wasila, they are the means to every single gharad, to every single aim. Just as, and he gives the example of har, harf, harf is a preposition or a particle, uh, in the, 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 with the grammarians, because in Arabic language, the Arabic grammarians t- tend to say that all words are divided into three major categories, nouns, verbs, and prepositions. And it's the prepositions that don't have any meanings in and of themselves. But once they're connected to other words, then they form phrases or sentences. And so this is the idea of money, that they don't have meanings in and of themselves. And Imam Ghazali was, was amongst many other scholars who gave primacy to uh, money in the form of gold and silver. We'll discuss later um, how forms of money exist in the Islamic tradition. But what I wanted to take from this slide is that we can see now straight away that uh, if we go back to those big definitions or the disputes between the anthropologists and economists, uh, the Muslim role of money uh, follows on by saying money is primarily meant to serve as a means of exchange. And uh, a very famous contemporary scholar, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, uh, actually presented a paper to uh, the, um, to, uh, I think it was the um, Davos, I think it might have been Davos, a paper where he was, yeah, sorry, the World Economic Forum. And it was a paper called Causes and Remedies of the Present Financial Crisis from an Islamic Perspective. And that paper obviously was on the, falling on the back of the 2008 financial crisis. And in that, he basically said that, um, that the Muslims were the pioneers before modern economists of the idea of money being a medium of exchange. But they also went further than modern economists by saying that the logical conclusion of that is that this means that Money should not be made an object of trade in and of itself. Money should, and this is the philosophical basis of the prohibition of interest. And so, so this depth of understanding was already amongst the Muslims. And they, this goes back to their seeing um, money as being a means by which uh, connection happens, right? In that deeper sense of the anthropological understanding of money uh, in the sense that uh, this is a way of of us connecting ourselves to other people and uh, this is a way of embodying uh, gratitude to god um, the quran says uh, and this is a very constant uh, reminder to for muslims to embody gratitude the quran says remember me and i will remember you and be grateful to me and do not be ingrate and ingrate um, and do not deny me and so this this sense of being grateful to god implies that that we use everything that's coming to us as a gift in whatsoever form it's been intended in and the gratitude of money is to use it for its purpose and so uh, just we will end this slide here, but I want to emphasize that this idea of money being trust inscribed, this is something that even Niall Ferguson, I think in his book, The Ascent of Money, touches upon this by saying, all standard economic definitions aside, uh, money is essentially uh, an abstraction, a construct that reveals our very perceptions, identities, and how we see trust. And so when... Uh, and money is encouraged to circulate, then it, it becomes a way of mutual aid and connection amongst human beings. But if money is redesigned in a alternate, alternative form, then, then this becomes an issue. And so the question I'm posing at the end of the slide is what is it then about modern money, which entails that instead of it being seen as a potential agent of mutual connection and cooperation, as it existed throughout centuries in the Muslim world and in the broader medieval world, and, and we'll touch upon this when we talk, talk about the historical trajectory of usury. How is it today that much of modern money has been perversely become the opposite, a means of separation? Many a person um, is hesitant to actually even lend money to their closest friends because they see that there's an almost danger that when money comes, it could co- have a conflict with relationship, the very opposite of of how money was seen. And so for this, we're going to go into a 
uh, broader trajectory um, of the Muslim world. So and that quote that I, I kind of mentioned of, of, uh, of Imam Ghazali, uh, I kind of touched upon uh, the idea of the dinar and the dirham. And this was, uh, in terms of the coinage, this was something that uh, by the time Imam Ghazali was there, this became the standard coinage of the Muslim world. So its coinage was, a, and the first gold dinar was coined uh, by uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, um, and this is within the first century of 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 of, um, of the Prophet's demise, uh, and very early on, and it was intended to replicate or rep represent a standard weightage that was familiar to uh, the, the Muslims already, because uh, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was when he, when 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 the community was being established in Medina, the first Muslim community. He affirmed what was already the um, the gold and the silver in in circulation at the time, right? So so there already was um, a gold and silver in circulation. Um, uh, the the Roman gold coin was known as denarius, uh, and the Persian silver coin was called drachma. Um, and I, I think this kind of idea of of these two things, these two coins, were already in existence. And the Prophet kind of affirmed them as well as other commodity forms of money. And we'll come to this. And so the, the Muslims built on this and, and they, um, within the first, very early on, when they had the capacity to mint their own coins, then this was what they did, the gold dinar and the, the silver dirham. And this was very important because these weightages also uh, were an idea of, of the tradition, like a lot of the jurisprudence was dictated by, by these coins. So the, let's start with the trajectory of money in, in, in the Muslim world. And obviously, uh, we first come to, we have to discuss the trajectory of money in terms of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and uh, his arrival in Medina. So the, many of you may be Muslims and so you're familiar with the fact that the first, from the time that Islam was revealed or the, or the Quran began to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, there was first a 13-year uh, wait uh, in, in, in um, firstly in, 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 um, in Mecca, and then later on there was another period in Medina. And so uh, the culmination of, of these two periods is what uh, 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 the 23 years of, of, the, of the prophecy of the Prophet Peace and blessings be upon him. And so um, it was only post-emigration to Medina that the social infrastructure of Islam was established. And it's very interesting that one of the very first things the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, did when he arrived in, in Mecca, sorry, in Medina, was to establish a place for the mosque and to establish a place for the market, thereby instituting this this twin understanding of uh, worship, a salah, and commerce that embodies that spirituality. Commerce is not seen as negative. Commerce has to also have a spiritual dynamic. And in fact, when the Prophet did that, he there were already four markets uh, existent within Medina. And these markets were all monopolies, either through the the the, the kind of pagan community that existed there, or the prevalent Jewish communities that were there, the Bani Quraida tribe who were actually in Medina. And what the Prophet specifically wanted to do was he then asked for land that could be purchased and then endowed as a trust. And that land would then become the land of the market, where the market would be established. Uh, the, the narrations say that the Prophet himself conducted a land survey and there were different sites he meant, went to. And it was uh, when another companion came and proposed a site, the Prophet affirmed it and said, this is your market. Trading should not be suspended therein, nor should anyone be prevented from trading. There should be no unfair taxes or unfair, uh, 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 there should be no unfair practices and no unfair, and no taxes will be levied on the market. So this is what, we first know as a historical development of an open market, which is why if we come back to David Graeber, the, the financial anthropologist I mentioned, he refers to the Islamic economy as the first real free trade economy. 
And this really was a free trade because this was an open market. There was no possibility of a monopoly in that market. And, and this fitted very much into this uh, idea of tijara, right? Uh, trade on antaradin, tijara, trade through mutual acceptance. Mutual acceptance. And uh, this kind of mutual acceptance that implies no coercion. No coercion in terms of a, 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 an authority. And so this is straight away se separating the role of the state. If the, the state had any role to play, then the role of the state was only to ensure that the market was, was, was truly being run free. That there was, uh, that, the, that the market forces were not being subjugated, right? And so, so uh, any barriers to entry were to be blocked from, were to be removed from the market. And so uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ tried his best or enabled the, uh, setting up a level playing field. And uh, it's very interesting because he himself uh, was a one of the, role, the primary roles he had um, was that he was a uh, merchant. And so um, he was a, a, a merchant who was known for his trustworthiness and for his sincerity. And uh, by instituting this market, this market is owned by everyone. Anyone can come, anyone from any faith, any background can come in the market and its rules are very much like open so there's no prior monopoly of anyone and so the role of regulation then is limited to what's known as hispa which is basically just to ensure that law and order and fair trading happens in the market now at the same time medina itself outside of the market also had um very effective almost like a welfare state dynamic whereby citizens who were outside of that baseline level of being able to support themselves were uh, given uh, ability, they could go uh, and stay in the mosque that was set up in this raised platform known as As-Suffa. And they were then supported by the broader community. So their upkeep and their maintenance and their food and everything was supported by the broader community. And the Prophet himself was the first and foremost in that, that he said, I will not eat any food myself if anyone from the people of Sufa is going hungry. And, uh, <clears throat> and there were lots of other things. One of the most powerful things was the institution of zakat, um, compulsory charity, which has uh, in, uh, any wealth above a certain level, what was known as nisab, which was about 80, the, the, the wealth equivalent of 85 grams of gold. And there was another measure for silver. And then there was another measure for people who had livestock and another measure for people who had crops and so on. And so anyone whose wealth is over a certain value, then they have to give a portion of that wealth to categories of other needy recipients from, from the amongst the Muslim community who are below that value. And so this redistribution measure um, ensured, and it was an incredibly successful uh, uh, instrument that ensured very shortly after the Prophet Sallallahu as Islam starts expanding, that there, uh, that there are literally no poor. There is eradication of poverty. Sorry, I just went on to another slide. There's an eradication of poverty in the Muslim world. Um, and so this, this becomes a very powerful thing. Now, now, what about the role of money itself? There is... Um, there is an interesting um, uh, statement or hadith of the Prophet in which he said, uh, gold is to be paid for gold, silver by silver, wheat by wheat, barley by barley, dates by dates, salt by salt, like by like, payment being made hand to hand. And he said, someone who adds an increase or asks for an increase, he said, has in fact dealt in usury, right? Uh, and so what he meant by that and this is the scholars have taken from this, that there are six commodities mentioned in addition to the bimetallic currencies, gold and silver. There's mentioning of wheat, barley, uh, uh, dates, salt, uh, and other things. And so this kind of um, uh, definition now uh, of these six commodities uh, has sparked a because because then the prophet follows on by saying someone who adds an addition to this. In other words, he said, with regards to them, the law of usury applies. The word for usury, riba, literally means an increase, right? 
Man zada or istazad, someone who asks for increase or puts an addition himself. Then this is a kind of so. In other words, someone who's dealing with who's 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 dealing with these things as as a kind of an increase. And so the people who are meant to deal with this have to do yadan bi yad, mithal mithlan bi mithal. So payment is to be made hand to hand and and on spot. And so this question arises, is that why were these six commodities only demarcated? And most of the scholars say that, that, um, that uh, this is to do with the idea of uh, the first two categories are thamaniya. So gold and silver takes on the value because it has a value. And therefore that's why riba applies. And then these other things seem to be food items. And they're, they're, they have thought miya, they have food items. And so... In the absence of gold and silver, this kind of alludes to the possibility of a kind of bartering through these things because there's as food items, uh, wheat, barley, dates, uh, salt, they have a relative degree of, of lust. They can last, right? And that's why the, 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 some of the Muslim scholars, especially the Hanafis, almost see these things as fungible. By fungible it means that as long as they can be denoted through weight, wasn't, and measure, then they, this becomes an objective criteria by which we can measure equivalence. So this becomes a type of measurement that allows for one of the functions of money, as we said, a unit of account, right? And so this equivalence means that anything, the Hanafis and these scholars say that anything that can replicate this kind of fungible equivalence can function as money, can function as money, as long as people are mutually willing to accept it as money. And so money is not limited just to these six commodities. Right? Having said that, almost all the scholars say there is a primacy here for the dinar and the dirham, primarily because um, it's the one form of currency that the Prophet himself uh, mentioned in this hadith, but has also found it's being mentioned uh, in the Qur'an. The Quran mentions the, the phrase dinar and the dirham. The Quran mentions gold and silver as being something of value. And so that's something that everyone agrees upon. And then there's also an agreement on obviously these commodities mentioned here. But if you take the broader principle of uh, anything that has equivalence or fungible, then that can be extended beyond that. That's why uh, many scholars, such as, as I just quoted the Hanafis, Imam Sarkhasi, one of the great scholars, said that when you have an obligation, when you have a side of equivalence, then this is something that has riba upon. And there's, uh, th th there's a famous statement um, uh, ascribed to um, uh, Malik uh, in which he said that if the people allowed skins of camels, right, skins of camels, uh, so leather, and it had upon it a sikka, a stamp of authority, and thereby acquired value as a currency. Ayin. It became something that people traded in. Then Imam Malik says, I would disapprove, disapprove of the exchange of these leather, of this leather, um, except that the, gold, the rules of gold and silver should apply to it. Right? In other words, it becomes a commodity that, or it becomes a form of money that simply, even though it's just leather, right? But if people agree that this thing has value, then it takes on the rule of thamaniya, of something that has value. And uh, this was also the opinion of other scholars as well. Uh, and so, so within this, we can find that there is even a potential allowance for token money, as long as that token money is genuinely accepted by people. Now, traditionally in cultures, people did accept tokens, right? But generally speaking, uh, you know, when you have an absence, when you have many different forms of currencies and people historically this is the record that people have inclined towards gold and silver and that's why this is the much of the muslim world this was the common form of, of coinage the gold and silver the dinar and dirham as we said and it's not that that, that they weren't um, seniorage which is a profit made by governments in issuing the, this coinage uh, between the face value of the coins and their own costs and it wasn't that um, debasement also happened, that through time, monies, the quality of, of, of this coinage, so gold and silver could actually change. So this, this itself sparked a whole discussion, like what is it that qualifies, um, what degree of gold and silver qualifies, 
coined as being gold and silver. We're not, we're not going to go into this too much, but it's just to show that scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and Makhrizi, these were great two scholars um, uh, of the Muslim world who almost, you know, predicted or, uh, you know, many centuries before uh, this economic principle known as, uh, of modern economics, known as Gresham's Law, which basically said that in the prevalence of many different types of currencies, then bad money will drive out good money. And so what Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, wanted to say was that if there are values of lots of different coins and they're all called um, um, the same thing, gold and silver, then people will generally collect uh, the bad coins and exchange them for the good money. They'll try to do that. And so eventually, um, uh, you know, this causes, uh, this will shift, right? The, 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 this will cause a shift whereby uh, the bad money will drive out the good money. And so this, uh, this idea, uh, you know, was something that did uh, concern the, the Muslim scholars. But if we look at the evolution of the Muslims in general, then the state uh, didn't play much, following in that, prophetic example, the state didn't play that big a role in, in directing them. The market itself had a certain sense of trust and the market itself, and the only role of the state was hispa to ensure that this openness of the market exists. And that's why someone like David Graeber, again, um, in his book, when he touches upon this, if you want to, if you do get his book, then it's from page 275 to 282, where he Kind of start speaking about the role of the market, and uh, one of the things he says is that um, that he says that Islam was the world's first popular free market ideology, and he said that the 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 genuineness of Islam or the Islamic economy was that they genuinely saw money as being something that uh, brings about mutual aid. And um, it was the scholars and the role of the courts officiated by scholars in a form of decentralization and autonom autonomousness that would often establish contracts, recover debts, uh, and, and, and even create a very sophisticated financial network of trade. In fact, the Muslims were the, were the ones governing the whole Silk Route, and they pioneered uh, Saks, which we go on to be known as checks. The word check comes from saks, and saftajas, which are like promissory notes that that allowed for credit relationships and letters of credit to operate to to uh, to do this because there was a genuine understanding that uh, that money itself, that this transaction that is based on trust and this type of honor. And so this market within the Muslim world became a manifestation of the principles of human freedom and communal society. And so David Graeber says that even today, if you look at the Muslim world, you'll see that the communities was, were organized to a large extent around the twin poles of the mosque and the bazaar, the mosque and the market, the souk, exactly the way Medina was first organized in the Prophet, largely independent of the governments operating according to its own rules. And um, uh, Imam Ghazali, as I touched upon, spoke about that. Others, um, David Graeber also quotes another uh, scholar known as Nasr Tusi, uh, who t spoke about this principle of, of the natural propensity of people to, to aid one another. What he does say, which is very interesting, David Graeber, he touches upon how Adam Smith, it appears, had copies, this is very interesting, it appears Adam Smith had copies of Nam Ghazali and Tusi, and he basically um, used many of verbatim, a lot of the examples that, that they used. So for example, Tusi uh, uses, or Imam Ghazali uh, uses an example of a needle factory, and, and Smith's, this is one of his most famous examples of division of labor, the pin factory. Um, and so he, he, it's almost a verbatim example of how these different things work. And so, so, but he says what was interesting is whereas both Imam Ghazali and other Muslim scholars were trying to allude to the need for mutual support and mutual aid, Smith turned that on its head 
and spoke about self-interest and the selfishness as being the primary principle. And we'll talk about that in, in the evolution of how um, money evolves in the, in the West. But all of this condenses into, um, into, a, a, uh, into a beautiful uh, and one of the largest surviving dynasties, the, the Ottoman dynasty, that prior to the invention of banking um, was, was, the, was like the world's most strongest economy. And uh, the question is, why did the Muslim world not end up with banks? Why did they not end up with the large-scale corporations and banks that eventually became the, the innovative drivers of what we know as capitalism? And David Graeber touches upon this by saying that he thinks there were two reasons why it didn't happen. So he says in his book, um, once again, Debt, the First uh, 5,000 Years, he says in his book on page 303, he says, why did nothing like modern capitalism emerge in the Muslim world? And he highlights two factors. Firstly, he says, Islamic merchants appear to have taken their free market ideology seriously. The marketplace did not fall under the direct supervision of the government. Contracts remained between individuals, ideally with a handshake and a glance at heaven, and thus honor and credit became largely indistinguishable. So honor was deeply tied in with credit. The second principle, he says, which is why they didn't form banks, is he says that... Um, the second principle is, is that with, with the Muslim world, despite having massive uh, owners of capital, so you had people on the side of the owners of capital, he says that um, the principle was, and it's the principle that was later enshrined in classical economic theory, but he says, but is not observed in practice, but the Muslims took this principle seriously, that profits are the reward for risk. And so trading enterprises were assumed to quite literally be risky adventures in which traders expose themselves. And uh, any financial mechanisms that are designed to avoid these risks were considered impious. And this was actually the objection to usury, because by demanding a fixed rate of interest, one basically guarantees for himself profits. And so this principle, because it was taken sincerely, and the Muslims believed in their profit, then this made forms of finance and insurance that were later to develop in Europe and go on to become the banks uh, impossible. So with this, we'll stop. Uh, in the, uh, the, the next presentation I'll give, I'll pick up the trajectory of money in Western Europe and touch upon how, in their case, the banks did come about and how that narration is very different to the narration of the Muslims. But... Uh, when we touch upon this, we'll also touch upon um, what happens post-creation of the first commercial bank. So this is the end of part one, but we revisit it, the trajectory of money in Western Europe. So subhanaka wa bihamdik, subhanan al-deen, wa al-asr inna nisana fi khusr, illa ladhina aminu wa aminu salihati wa tuwasa bil-haqi wa tuwasa bil-sabr.